aspect of business innovation and skills isn't with us yet, but he's apparently going to appear at, uh, at any moment. So he'll make a dramatic entry uh, after Vicky has uh, no doubt started speaking. I just want, uh, as well as welcoming you and welcoming our distinguished uh, panel, to thank FTI uh, Finance Consultancy for sponsoring this event. Uh, they had no choice because uh, Vicky is senior managing director there. <laughs> as they were told, but we're extremely, extremely grateful to them. Also, very, very grateful, <coughs> Vicky, for the sterling work you've done in writing this highly stimulating uh, paper for the IFG. To Evan uh, Davis, who is going to do his uh, job he always does so brilliantly every morning, comparing a challenging discussion and asking the penetrating questions. And uh, Jonathan Porter is the director of the National Institute for Economic and Social Research, who's uh, going to rehearse the lines that he normally gives uh, uh, Evan in response about uh, <laughs> <laughs> Evan. <laughs> uh, Evan, the field is yours. Thank you very much indeed, Andrew. Welcome, everybody. Vince, I think, was, uh, is, is going to get here at five past six, uh, <laughs> which tells you a lot about uh, forecasting and economics in government. Uh, we're going to hear a paper called The Dismal Science, is economics influential enough in government decision making? Let me just set out a little bit about the dismal science bit of that before we get the, uh, the paper and the thoughts on government decision making. Uh, I really do wonder how many people have just been struck by what a terrible shock economics has been through in the last four years. I just, uh, every day, uh, one is just struck by how useless the subject has been yeah. <laughs> in, so many, in so many interesting areas. Oh, like, um, Macroeconomics, um, I mean, it's interesting, it, it, for those who, who are not aware of it, it, went down the path of a set of models called uh, dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models, in which economists seriously do argue about whether these are completely useless or not. Um, they certainly were completely useless uh, in, in, in forecasting the uh, configuration of macroeconomic events over the last few years. Um, I was brought up with microeconomics. Uh, I was always a bit snippy about macro. We thought macro was kind of easy. Mervyn King made it look easy because he picked it up very quickly. He was a microeconomist who just became uh, governor of the Bank of England on the back of sort of picking up macro, and it made it all look very simple. So I was rather snippy about macro. Um, then, A, it turned out that macro was actually quite important after all. Uh, and B, a lot of the failings of macroeconomics came out of it trying to, trying to build microeconomic foundations to what it was doing, to trying to build a kind of rational person underpin to the, uh, the macro theories, which obviously got macro absolutely nowhere. Uh, one can't help but be struck by how bendable a lot of... Uh, microeconomics is. You can take something like the Stern Review and you can ask yourself, has it really persuaded anybody or has it really just divided people along the lines that they first thought of before it came out? Um, are economists just the, uh, the best social scientists money can buy and you just get the, the view you want out of them? And then we have in microeconomics the other problem that many of the certainties there have turned out to be so uncertain after all, just as the dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models were arguably a complete waste of time. Financial economics, potentially just a complete waste of time uh, over the last, uh, the last 20 years. Uh, many of the insights just turned out to be uh, distract distractions from, from where all the action is, which are in the frictions and in the, the little bits of the theory that have generally uh, assumed away the little behavioral Assumptions. So they've all come to um, they've all come to attention in the last few years. Uh, but would we do without economics and economic economists? I don't think so. And I'm struck by that. There's a line at the end of Annie Hall, the, the Woody Allen movie, where he's talking to this friend of his. I can't remember it exactly, but he says, "My sister, my, my brother-in-law thinks he's a chicken." Uh, and his friend says, "Well, why don't you tell him he's not a chicken?" And Woody Allen says, "Well, we would, but we need the eggs." <laughs> and it's a bit like that, you know, it's, we all know that a lot of it's nonsense, <coughs> but we dare not say we don't need it because the eggs are just so tasty and so useful uh, in government. Well, anyway, that's uh, just a little bit of uh, reflection from me and why I'm so depressed about the subject which I've studied for so long. Um, what we're going to hear is we're going to have 20 minutes in which Vicky will set out the paper for those of you who haven't had a chance to read it uh, and give some of her thoughts. Uh, then we will take 10 minutes each from Jonathan first and then from Vince 
hoping he's here. We couldn't have asked for a better panel of people who have experience in both the private sector and in government, crossing the ministerial, uh, at ministerial level, uh, at <coughs> official level, and as I say, in the private sector too. But let's start, uh, Vicky, maybe you can take us through the dismal science, is economics influential enough in government decision making? Thank you, I'm going to try and get over there. Well, I have to say, I was quite struck by your introduction, um, Evan. Um, I, mean, I thought it was bad enough to be standing in front of you having to um, admit that I was asked to speak and then you wanted to pay for it. <laughs> uh, but, but now, economics has been completely demolished, as far as I can see, by an economist. Um, so it's a bit hard for me to say the rest of what I have to say, uh, particularly since it's supposed to be trying to show how influential we should be um, in government. But let me just go back and try and remind people what economics is all about and why we can eat um, the sort of eggs, if you like, that we want to keep. Um, so economics is a discipline um, which is fundamentally about ways to allocate scarce resources, and that is really important for government. Um, s scarcity of resources is a perennial issue in public policy. This means that economics has much to offer to those responsible for resource allocation, which of course is very insignificant right this minute. This is both of the official, and there are a number of perm sex here, um, or ex perm sex as well, um, and the political level. And governments are typically either spending the public's money, uh, which they have some concerns about, or are asking, or very often sort of forcing citizens and businesses to spend their own time and money in ways uh, which they perceive are going to uh, serve the public good. And in a democratic society we're in, it is essential that such decisions are transparent, that they are consistent, and of course that they're explained to the population at large, but of course also very often to Parliament, in ways that enable governments to be held to account by all of us. And it is therefore, what, despite what we've just heard, my contention that economists, whether or not you regard them as proper scientists or whether you think they're always right or most of the time wrong, let's say, um, and if you think they're dismal, possibly, it is important that they're viewed as true friends of good government and democracy. And I think that is our role. And we can't get it always right. It's very, I'm very often asked what the issue is. Of course, uh, and of course as economists, we've gone through the whole issue of uh, should we have rational expectations, irrational expectations? Do we assume people are rational? And I always say that the reason why economists get it wrong is because the politicians are irrational. And we are always assuming that they're rational. I think that's probably our mistake. If you think back on what happened uh, with the financial crisis, I do remember being in the house of a very, very senior regulator the night before Lehman's was led to um, go to the wall. Um, and we're all saying there's absolutely no way this is going to happen. So nothing to worry about. Politicians will be rational to the very end. And of course, we were. So I think we have to bear in mind that economists in uh, sort of an advisory capacity in government have that little problem, but also economists on the outside who are probably even further away from how policies are made uh, get it even more wrong as a result. And economists like to think of what they do um, and what they preach as a science. And they've tried to ape scientific method whenever you know, we can. And that is all to the good. It brings a sort of rigor, lots of maths, econometrics, and so on. It brings clarity of thought. And that clarity of thought and rigor is often missing in other disciplines. And there may be some other disciplines in government represented here right now. And I do apologize if we've said this badly. But um, we are slightly more curious than we are. Okay. Thank you. Except, of course, for the scientists who yeah. themselves Fair are a very, very significant and growing part of what the government uh, is uh, turning to for advice. Hello. But in fact, it is clearly a social science. Economics is not a, an absolute science, but a social science. There are no absolute laws. There are no 100% controlled experiments that we can turn to. Indeed, the outcome of an experiment one day can be different the next day because of the funny habit that people have of not always acting the same way. So just looking at what's going on right now, lower interest rates usually mean we get more demand in the economy, but not as now if the rest of the economy is nervous guy. Oops, I didn't quite mean that. If the rest of the economy is, is not doing particularly well, <laughs> if cons consumers, businesses, and investors just don't trust the future. 
which in itself, of course, puts put a sort of boundary uh, on what the latest economic fad, um, if I'm solid that, I'm, I'm in very dangerous territory right now, behavioral economics, uh, what it can tell us in terms of helping us to predict the future. And frankly, in my view, uh, doesn't tell us a lot, and I do risk being ostracized by a large part of the UK academic economic establishment for saying so. But the politicians want action, and they usually want it quickly. They also want certainty about the impact of their actions. It is easy to see, therefore, why the relationship between the world of policymaking and politics, of course, and economics will never be an easy one. In politics, there's a need to make decisions, stick to a timetable, and once having made them, however uncertain the evidence really was, to argue for it, not accept any doubt, not be seen to make a U-turn, although we've seen some of those recently, not wait for the results of lengthy, randomized control group experiments that we quite like to do. And the decision point, a public sector economist who tells the decision maker that it's all very difficult and very uncertain, is not much help and will soon find themselves not invited back. But another problem with economists is who were, and particularly, of course, with the policymakers who work for them, is that economists do not always agree. Um, those of you who've been in discussions between government departments, economists, different government departments, economists, and even within a government, uh, the economists there, from different bits of it, can see that is indeed uh, a fact. And there, well, there's no accident, really, that there are so many jokes about economists, although scientists, of course, also disagree. Uh, they may be not quite so often and not very publicly, except for some of the big, big issues, like climate change, for example, recently, although even that disagreement seems to have disappeared. But in economics, such disagreement is pretty transparent. And we've heard about macroeconomic policy. Um, how many times do you have people disagreeing on the radio about what should happen? There is, thankfully, a bit more consensus on micro-policy, because most economists are other are rather sort of conventional um, and of the neoclassical school. So they take on board all the elements of this, that markets are basically a good thing, of course, people outside might disagree, that they are generally rational, okay, there's been a bit of debate on that, but overall that's what they think, that interventions and subsidies distort that market, that taxes are bad for work effort, and so on. And it, at times they also assume that the market works perfectly, and we've seen what happens with that. But economics, per se, doesn't actually tell you that, only a particular branch of it. And at some point, inevitably, um, under some sort of political pressure or allowance, if you like, uh, one of those paradigms, like that the markets are efficient and work perfectly, may have become too powerful in policy making. That was the case not only during the Thatcher years, but we could argue that that was also the case for part of uh, Labour years. But although there was been some move away from that following the financial crash of 2008, there's no doubt that economists do bring a certain amount of baggage to issues which they would claim are based uh, in the profession. But others might argue we're just one way of looking at the world. So we say economics says that, but actually not necessarily. And then, of course, the danger emerges that once you start no longer believing in efficient markets, do you then extend this to all areas of economic activity, which was certainly the tendency after the financial crash. I can tell you that, having been involved very much in this, and Dave Ramson, who's here, can... Um, just so um, hopefully agree with, with my um, assessment of what was going on. And that, of course, immediately justifies extensive regulation and intervention in the market. But surely not. As economists, we know that cannot be true. And in any case, how does this sit with the attempt to reduce the size and role of the state, which is what the coalition government is supposedly trying to achieve in line with mostly conservative and liberal ideologies? So, um, economists like a world where we have where we can put numbers on things, where we can balance out the benefits of a move against, of a sort of move uh, of uh, a particular policy, so the benefits of that against the costs. And often, and we've heard this discounting issue from Evan, which is really the issue about the next turn review, with fancy methods of discounting, we can even compare streams of benefits and costs across time. And then disagree hugely about what that discount uh, should be. But this gives rise to at least two problems. First, because economists can measure loads of different things, but not necessarily decide between different priorities, they ideally need what they would call a utility function. And they want someone to tell them what this utility function is. And that's where the, policy the, 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 the politicians, if you like, come in. In simpler words, they want to know the weights that policymakers give in terms of trade-offs that may be in a, in a particular policy. 
how much does one, for example, value efficiency relative to increasing inequality? How important is the environment relative to achieving growth? The big debate right now. How much regional balance do we want versus achieving growth in aggregate output? And how much, you know, whatever the theory of the social time preference or cost of capital may be, do policymakers really value the bird in the hand right now over two in the bush? And in practice, the problem is that policymakers are unable usually to define at all precisely what the trade-offs are. They sometimes reveal this in the decisions they make, so what we commonly call the field preference. But in general, these trade-offs remain unclear, obscure, and certainly not transparent to us economists who are there to advise. In such circumstances, decisions often get made on what works fast, brings in money quickly, which is the issue now, or costs less, or cuts costs the most, or the fastest. And this can be very frustrating for economists who spend their lives trying to maximize an obscure concept of the net present value, but which rarely wins votes or plaudits from the commentators, and so is often rejected, actually, by policymakers too. And second, despite all their nice theories, our nice theories, Economists have also noticed that their methodological process is not how policies actually get made. So being economists, they've tried to apply economics to work out how decisions are actually made. So, um, what does it mean, finally, in terms of our job, trying to influence others? How can we make ourselves relevant to policy? We can have fantastic academic qualifications, but if we're not able to help people understand the environment in which politicians are operating and presenting them with options that exist to influence future events, to meet the ambitions, of course, of the party in power, they will be ignored. But money needs to be spent wisely, and the impact of policy actions on the economy needs to be properly assessed, whether we like it or not. There is this accountability issue we've all been talking about. We have, thankfully, the type of civil service in this country that doesn't change each time a new party is elected, which I find actually is the most frustrating thing in another country I know quite well, which is Greece, where actually very little happens. What we have here is continuity, and also we have a serious competence that has been developed over the years that we can rely on. And unlike many countries in Europe, although we have think tanks of the sort that Jonathan here represents, we tend to rely a lot on a competent civil service which is impartial. So, um, how do we actually increase our influence? There was a process which I think started under Gus O'Donnell, of course the GS, the Government Economic Service, has been in existence for a while. But the process under Gus to raise the influence of economists was pushed forward by Nick Stern, uh, Lord Stern, as head of the GS, under whom I served as deputy, along with the current head of the Institute for Fiscal Studies, Paul Johnson, who should have been here. Maybe he is, and I can't see him. And since Dave Ramsden of the Treasury took over as uh, chief economist there, he and I became joint heads of the GS for three gloriously fan <coughs> fun years. We were both Chelsea fans, and I think that helped hugely. Um, the seniority of the GS economists in, in government, which was actually pretty low, um, went up significantly. The GS board that we had was further strengthened to, to achieve this. And through these moves and the sort of mutual support of the economics profession, working with other disciplines and academics, economics became increasingly relevant. Our numbers increased, uh, and we were increasingly listened to. But in a way, I think the defining moment, yes, we may have got it wrong as forecasters, but the defining moment for, for public sector economists was the recession that we saw, the financial crisis. It was, um, if I may use this term, a good crisis for economists in government. We all felt wanted, we all felt needed. It was absolutely clear. The National Economic Council Officials Group, um, which Dave and I sat on, which was set to support the cabinet NEC, was an awful demonstration of this. Uh, it was a group chaired by Gus, uh, O'Donnell, and uh, also Nick McPherson, jointly. They took it in, in terms to do that. They were all the permanent secretaries of the growth departments. Uh, they were, you know, they allowed Dave and myself to be there uh, as well, which was absolutely brilliant. It was a real demonstration of how economics increasingly um, mattered. But what about now? Um, things improved a little bit, of course, for a while. I don't think there is an NEC or an NEC official equivalent, and, and, and maybe there is something, something there that I haven't noticed. But the current troubled external environment, which has direct implications for the UK, uh, and the impact, of course, that that has too, if we don't grow fast enough, on the deficit reduction plans, 
should mean that economic advice is crucial right at this minute. But of course, we know there are cuts across the public sector. Analysts cannot be immune from this. And yet, the need for good advice um, <coughs> is more needed now than, than ever because it is a very confusing environment out there. So economists, again, need to make themselves as relevant as they possibly can. So to sum up, um, as economists in government, we know that the various departments, of course, have to translate manifestos that are there into policies to achieve the government's aims. That is clear. This is where we start from. This is what they want to do, and we're there to help them do so. The question is how. So within this confine, it is the duty of the civil servant to ensure that their permanent secretary can stand up in front of the PAC and the FAO and any other bodies that there may be, and generally the parliament, and also, of course, their cabinet uh, colleagues, and be able to declare that the nation's finances have been wisely spent and that the impact of the various measures that have been put in place to deal with whatever issue it is that we're dealing with have been properly assessed before various policies are set in train and that they're being properly evaluated and monitored throughout the process. So the role of the economists within this is clear. It is to find the proper evidence relevant to the issue and to advise ministers on what it says and to be clear where this evidence doesn't exist. It is often the case that this evidence just isn't there. During the recession period, when we're trying everything, we didn't really know whether some of the things would work. Uh, and it's clear that some didn't, but others did. I think there was, for once, this real ability to experiment and also the willingness to say, we've got it wrong in this particular area. And we should be doing something perhaps that's different or we withdraw this particular measure that we uh, encouraged to be put in place. But because of this difficulty that there exists in terms of evidence, the economist needs to advise which other options must, should be considered, if the evidence isn't there, uh, and, and how to go about collecting evidence as you move it along. And in some cases, it is quite clear that the evidence will not support a ministerial move. What happens there is that it is our duty as civil servants to protect, if you're an economist, or the duty of civil servants to protect the permanent secretary and then a direction is required um, by the minister for whom they work. In other words, the minister directs the department, cite the evidence, they're convinced that this should happen, and it goes ahead and, and happens. Um, and that, in my experience, was the case a number of times in this. And actually, we as economists are rather proud when a direction is given, because you're under such pressure when the minister still wants to do something, and you say, actually, it's bad value for money and not good for the economy, um, and you're able to withstand all this pressure that comes to you from their, 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 their office, all the other ministers, other government departments as well, um, all of whom are trying for whatever reason to get you to look at the evidence again. And surely, surely there must be a way in which we can prove that this is good, good value for money. Well, it very often isn't. As I said in my leading speech from Biz, if one is loved by all <coughs> policy makers as an economist in the civil service, and one is definitely not doing their job properly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vicky. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask yeah, Vince if you want to, to come up. I'll get Jonathan to speak first. Um, Vicky, just so we've got something concrete to focus on, look back on your career in. Give us a, a good example of a decision which you influenced, which, proud of, which, which wouldn't have been made in the absence of the economics. Okay, well, I, was I thought you'd ask me the opposite, which is the ones that I, I tried to stop. Um, oh, that, okay, so did, you, that yeah. one. which one did you succeed in stopping on the basis of the economic? Well, I didn't stop it, but I got direction, uh, which is a scrapping scheme um, for, Cut. remember it, yeah. um, which um, clearly uh, was going to have a good impact on the mo on, on most of the traders, if you like, in the sense that, you know, people who, who would have more people asking for, you know, buying and selling cars, which is good. Um, but it wouldn't do a huge amount for the UK car industry since most of those cars were going to be little cars produced in Italy, France possibly, uh, Japan and so on, which is exactly what it was proved mm. to be. Um, so I was dead against it and then there was an extension of it and uh, there, was, there had been a change of firm sec at that time and although I had agreed with my first firm sec who was um, uh, Andrew Kahn, who's here somewhere, uh, and we convinced, we convinced the minister at the time um, to, to, to accept the first one. 
Um, when the extension came round, um, Mrs. Anderson had some concerns about this and uh, didn't really necessarily agree with our sort of push for another direction because nothing had changed. Now, the policymakers were all producing all sorts of, you know, new surveys showing this and the other, and each of them, and they meant nothing. Uh, and the great thing is that I got support from Gus. I thought I was quite beside myself. The support from Gus and everyone else to, to pursue with this. And, um, and, of course, we got a direction for it. I then went promptly and sold my two Volvos and uh, changed them to two little Fiat's. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a personal, so you know, personally made huge amount of sense. Okay, so for the economy didn't. Okay, so it's terrific that you managed to get a direction and show the minister had made a mistake. But let's think of, give us one where it actually you successfully influenced policy. There must be some where you <laughs> successfully. <laughs> well, I mean, most of the sort of industrial policy initiatives that were taken by, by, by the government um, needed uh, proper assessment as to whether they made sense or not. Uh, getting rid of a number of the business support schemes, said, investing or not investing in, in particular industries. Um, so, so those are, e practically everything that came out of the department was, needed, was had needed uh, sort of an, an given assessment, the stamp, given the economic stamp. Yeah, okay. well, but I have to add that you need the economic stamp and the financial stamp in the sense that there had to be, what we agreed was that everything that was decided in the, in the department mm. had to have both chief economist and chief finance officer approval. So it had to also be affordable. So it's not good enough just saying it's good if I have some money if there is no money actually to right, spend on right, it. Right. Okay, well, let's get, um, let's get two responses. Um, Jonathan Porter has, has, has worked in Treasury everywhere. I mean, Department of Work and Pensions. Jonathan, why don't you take us through your experience and your reaction to what Vicky's been saying? Okay, let me, while I remember them, quickly respond to your, your challenge of what I may or may not have influenced. I think the, the first useful thing I did when I was a very, very junior Treasury official um, working for Robert Culpin, who a number of people in this room remember, and working with Richard Price, who lots of people will know, who was uh, uh, um, a colleague of Vicky and mine on, as, as, uh, um, on, as on the GES board. Uh, was uh, convincing the Treasury that the uh, tax favoritism shown to diesel versus petrol made absolutely no economic sense whatsoever and was environmentally damaging. Uh, and the Treasury, uh, to its credit, under Nigel Lawson, did, uh, did move away from that. Uh, so it was a relatively small thing, but it was an example actually where just the economics and nothing else did change the policy. Uh, the second thing, I think, uh, where economics wasn't the only thing, but it did play a big part, and I did, I think, have some personal role, was the government's decision uh, not to impose transitional restrictions uh, when, uh, the, uh, on free movement of workers when the uh, Eastern European countries joined in 2004, uh, a decision which uh, I'm sure the politicians uh, uh, who um, accepted that advice now thoroughly regret uh, as Mr. Cooper said the other day, uh, it was a mistake, uh, um, uh, but uh, I remain convinced it was entirely the right policy uh, for the country. And, um, and then the third one, I guess, is the, uh, um, uh, what we now call the bank tax or whatever, but it was originally conceived as a systematic risk levy uh, devised between the Cabinet Office and the Treasury uh, under the previous government, but very much taken up and, and implemented by, uh, by this one, uh, which I think, again, is a good example of policy that was based on, on, on sound economics and, and which uh, uh, was convincing to, to ministers of both parties. Uh, but on the broader question, what, what are government economists actually here for? What, what is it that government economists can usefully do? Um, let me start off by saying what I don't think they can do, going back to Evan's introduction. Uh, I think uh, for ministers or the public to look to government economics for forecasts, and by forecasts I mean predictions of what will happen, uh, not just macroeconomic forecasts, but actually predictions of what will happen to the economy, or indeed predictions of what will be the impact of particular policies, is frankly not a terribly uh, sensible thing to do, nor a terribly good use of government economists' time. Uh, there are lots of economists out there in the real world who have access to just as much information, um, who are just as, as likely to get it right. Um, and in fact, uh, I was reading something today, it's a slight aside, but uh, um, uh, Brad DeLong on his blog recently said that uh, um, uh, pointed, out, pointed to a, a point that he made about two years ago, which was since uh, about 2000 or so, probably when uh, um, 
George Bush was elected for the first time, uh, the Earth had entered this alternate economic universe uh, in which uh, Paul Krugman was always right. Uh, <laughs> and uh, this was fine because he had a lot of respect for Paul Krugman. The, the unfortunate thing was that he was such a miserable bastard. <laughs> uh, and it has to be said, had, uh, um, had Vince and George Osborne uh, listened to Brad two years ago and instead of listening to people like me or Vicky or... Dave or Alan, uh, uh, sorry to name names, but other people in this room, uh, then policy might actually have worked out somewhat better, at least on the uh, macro front, uh, which is not a criticism of me or Vicky or Alan or Dave or any of us, but simply a, an observation that actually you can get your macro stuff and indeed a lot of stuff uh, generally from people out there. But I think that also actually applies to, to predicting the impact of policy as opposed to assessing po and evaluating policy. And let me set out what that, what I mean. I think what economists within government can actually bring to advisors to in, in terms of giving advice to ministers is, is basically three things. So let me say them in order. Um, the first one is, is what I would call the economist's bag of tricks. Uh, the sort of con the way economists think about things that help you not decide what policy is likely to do, but how to think about policy. Uh, and there are several ones. So the obvious ones that I would that come to mind are things like opportunity cost. The fact that you don't spend, that choosing to do something also means choosing not to do something. Choosing to spend money on heart transplants means choosing not to spend money on cataract operations. Something which helps a small number of people to uh, you know, to live rather than die versus something that improves the quality of life for a large number of people. Economists can't tell you necessarily what the right answer is in making that choice, but they can point out that it is a choice. Um, second one might be general equilibrium, the sense that if you change something a little bit over here, it will have impacts over there. Setting up free schools doesn't just affect the quality of education for the kids in those schools. Potentially, it affects the quality of education for all kids. Uh, again, doesn't tell you whether it's good or bad policy, but tells you how to think about policy. Um, and finally, the one that, that Gus is favorite, Gus isn't here, but he'd be very annoyed if I didn't say that correlation is not causation, except when it is, and as economists and that of other social scientists try to explain when that's the case. Second thing economists can usually do, and this addresses a number of points that Vicky made, um, which is, is that you know, there, there is no certainty in social scientists, and, and this is best summed up famously by Harry Truman, who said, please bring me a one-handed economist. Uh, there aren't any proofs in social science. There's always an economics paper that says the opposite of whatever the first paper says. Um, so what's uh, the job of government economists? I think, for me, it's to assess without prejudice when evidence is good enough. Evidence is never perfect, but there's usually some evidence out there. So to try and say when the evidence is good enough for something, good enough to take a decision, is a really important function. Other social scientists do it, but in practice, economists probably do more of it. Um, and that's not an ideology-free function uh, because there aren't proofs and because good enough is a subjective judgment. But doing that well, as I say, not without ideology, but without prejudice, uh, is, is a second important function. Um, and third, lastly, um, and uh, I think for me the most important function of government economists is, is to um, explain things that satisfy what I call the, the Ulam Samuelson criterion. Um, Stanislas Ulam um, was um, one of the uh, greatest mathematicians of the 20th century, described uh, um, as the father, along with Edward Teller, of the hydrogen bomb. Um, and uh, Paul Samuelson, of course, as most of you probably know, was described as the father, father of modern economics. Ulam famously asked Samuelson whether economists had ever come up with one single idea which was, at the same time, <coughs> true but not obvious, uh, which was a very good question indeed. Um, and Samuelson's reply, which was a very good answer, uh, although it did take him a while, to several years, I believe, to think of it. <laughs> so, the principle of comparative advantage. Uh, and that's right, that's something which is true but not obvious. Uh, 
And in line with this, my view is that the most important function of the economist government is, is to try and explain ideas which do satisfy this criterion to ministers. Um, Vicky already mentioned comparative advantage, I think, and I'm sure she's explained it to many ministers over the years. Uh, let me uh, set out my, the list of, of ones which I think uh, 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 I've tried to explain which are important. Um, I've said a number of times that I, I explained to six successive secretaries of state for the Department of Work and Pensions the lump of labor fallacy, uh, the idea that there's not a fixed number of jobs in the economy, uh, that by sacking older workers you don't create jobs for younger workers, that by reducing the working week you don't increase the number of jobs, that by uh, um, keeping out immigrants you don't necessarily create jobs for natives. Um, that's a quite a basic concept, but it is quite a difficult one to grasp, and quite intelligent people can reasonably say on the face of it, it that doesn't seem right. So I actually think that was a really useful, important function, and I did think, do think it changed policy. Um, second one, more topical, is the Mondigliani-Miller theorem, um, which is probably less uh, uh, familiar to, to many of you, but it basically says that how a business is financed doesn't affect the things it's sensible for to invest in. Uh, which again sort of seems obvious, but in the context of the debate about bank capital is really, really important. It says that as a first approximation, telling banks to hold more capital should not make them less profitable, should not make it more difficult for them to secure investment, and shouldn't reduce lending. Uh, so that's quite an important insight. And the first thing one should say to any banker who says, well, you're going to force me to hold all this capital, you do realize it's going to uh, really hurt the real economy, is to get them to explain why the Modigliani-Miller theorem doesn't hold. Uh, and they generally find that pretty difficult, frankly. Um, now, you know, th neither of those two is, is true all the time. As I said, there are no proofs in social science. Uh, there are various assumptions you have to have uh, um, for those things to be valid. But they are still a very good starting point and very important to explain. Um, and then the final one, which I can't resist because uh, um, uh, 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 it's even more important at the moment, um, is, uh, of course, the paradox of thrift. Keynes is famous insight as to why, if we all start try and save more at the same time, businesses, households, and government, uh, then the economy is quite likely to go down the pan. Um, I did try to explain this to David Cameron in the Guardian article uh, uh, two weeks ago. Um, so far, it doesn't seem to have had much impact, but I'm doing my best, and I'll stop there. Thank you very much indeed, Jonathan. I mean, I'm interested in that migration, that migration one. You explained the lump of labor fallacy. They, let, um, they didn't have transitional controls on uh, Central and East European. I mean, economics famously predicted, economists, it was economists who predicted 15,000 would come. Is that right? Is one come. <laughs> what, what was what the origin of that, that, that famous prediction that was seen as one of the most terrible predictions. Uh, um, in, in it, was, uh, uh, it was a study commissioned by the Home Office from uh, some very good academi uh, uh, academic economists at University College London. Um, it was based partly, it was based on historical experience, um, the experience of previous expansions. It was based on empirical evidence and, you know, the past is different from the future. Yeah. It did crucially assume that Germany did not take the same decision, that took the same decision as right. we did. And right. so uh, um, it was, even at the time, they made clear it was not valid in the circumstances which ultimately obtained that we opened our labor markets and other countries didn't. But I think there are two, those are two different things. Yeah. One is a prediction. Um, we can go straight to your point that actually, and I think Vicky would agree that if you're looking for sort of a model that churns out precise numbers and gives you the answer to the question. Um, that's not the use, and that really seems to be the consensus developing. What it is, is it's about insights, be they things like Medigliana Miller, be they paradox of thrift, be they um, any number of uh, lump of labor, any number of kind of little toolkit things um, in that sort of, so it's, it's, it's viewing economics as a kit of rather interesting and useful analytical tools that frame public policy issues. The prisoner's dilemma is another yes. very good one. Yes. I mean, once you've got it and you see them, it's a very helpful way of looking at issues, and it's that that we want economists and government for. Excellent, okay, well, someone who's been an economist and then went into government. Uh, Vince, give us the benefit of your uh, broad experience on both sides of 
the divide? Well, maybe I should start with a, um, a sort of evidence-based judgment on the role of economists based on a sample size of one, <laughs> which is Vicky, uh, who was chief economist in my department when I came in, uh, and made a really massive impact on two grounds. I think one was a willingness to challenge and challenge conventional civil service ways of thinking and doing things. And the other was always to insist that there was evidence before we made a decision. And I, that may be down to Vicky, but I think it's also the tradition which economists have brought into government and is a healthy one. Uh, what, what I, 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 I like to think I was an economist once, but I've never actually been an economist in government. I have been a civil servant, and I have been a policy advisor back three decades ago, more than three decades. And I thought it was quite useful to reflect on how evidence-based decision-making has evolved over those three decades or more. So I think there has been a massive change for the better. And I sort of made a list of some of the really important ways in which we now make decisions, which we didn't make a generation ago. I mean, start with basic macroeconomic policy, the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee. I mean, there are people in this room of my vintage who will remember the days when interest rates were set primarily around electoral timetables. You know, the interest rates had to be set to give the right mortgage rate for a key by-election or a general election. I mean, we now make them on economic criteria. They may be right or wrong, but we do them on objective evidence-based uh, considerations. I think another one which has worked so successfully we hardly ever talk about it uh, is the Low Pay Commission. You know, minimum wages are in many ways, you know, highly ideological, very controversial, but nobody certainly in this government is suggesting we change that system. It's, it's, it has a balance of considerations uh, in terms of interest groups, but it ultimately relies on economic data about labor markets, and it works well, and uh, it's now institutionally established. Uh, another one is NICE. I w used to be infuriated as a constituency MP when I had people with, you know, fatal illnesses uh, who couldn't get key drugs uh, and had everything been left to the choice of politicians, you know, uh, decisions would have been totally capricious. But as Jonathan says, there are opportunity cost issues, there are cost things, there's the relative, both the health impact and the economic impact. We now have an independent agency to judge that and policy making has greatly improved as a result. A couple of other really big things that happened uh, under the last government. Uh, one was that basic pensions policy, the Turner Review, incredibly difficult issue, potentially a massive political football, but you had a high-powered group looking at evidence, trying to make a decision that would, would stand the test of time from one government to the next based on evidence, based on information, and by and large, those decisions have been implemented and they were difficult and will be stuck by. Or another one that was technically even more challenging, and I think reflected great credit on the people concerned, was Nick Stern's climate change review. I mean, it was a brilliant piece of work and involved economists not really understanding or trying to introduce economic methodology, but also trying to understand the science, which is complex. Uh, but it's established uh, an objective basis for making decisions on climate change. I mean, I know this is controversial both in terms of the science and in terms of economic policy measures. But we, we, have a, we have a basis of analysis that we can refer to. And, uh, you know, many of us regard as sort of essentially non-political. Uh, or to take another case, I mean, only last week we had the, uh, the Waitman report on nuclear power. Again, a good example, I think, of, you know, a way of dealing with a decision that is potentially highly emotional but dealing with it in a detached way of assessment of risk. And nuclear power is a good example because I think of all the, exam of all the cases we have, there's, it's the biggest disparity between the public perception of risk and actual risk if you measure it objectively in terms of lives lost through accidents. An enormous disparity, so you, you, in, you create a process in which these things are looked at objectively, and as, as indeed was the case. And I think finally there's a whole series of decisions that I have to make, or my department has to make, in w when, where, where we're surrounded by, I think, basically good processes uh, which enable us to proceed in a more rational basis than we otherwise would. Probably the most difficult decision the government had to make in the early stages, apart from the deficit stuff, was about uh, university finance. Um, 
highly controversial, politically um, costly in some way, that I was able to refer to the Brown report, I wasn't commissioned it, but inherited it, that had some very good analytical work on graduate premier, making the point that social uh, investment, public spending, is generating significant private gain, uh, which potentially should be taxed, which is essentially what we're doing through the loan scheme, uh, and provided a basis of evidence about um, on which we could make intelligent decisions about student finance. Uh, another one is I'm currently trying to pursue a more activist uh, industry policy, for want of a better word, uh, albeit in an environment where we're severely constrained with cash and we're trying to avoid some of the mistakes that were made in the past when governments intervened picking winners and trying to avoid losers and not succeeding. And the way we do it is essentially we create a firewall between ministers and specific decisions so we have the Technology Strategy Board, which is outside government, but outside government, which make, gives advice on, uh, in terms of basic technology decisions, setting up technology innovation. And we have the Industrial Development Board, which gives us advice on industrial projects and cost-benefit of intervention, the extent to which new private capital is leveraged in by public decisions and so on. So we have an evidence base on which to make what could potentially be highly political and potentially very inefficient decisions. Um, to take the fraught issue of banking, one of the reasons we've made such headway in terms of structural reform is that we had the Vickers Commission. Uh, both parties in the coalition agreed to it, uh, agreed to the terms of reference. We had some excellent people, good backup, empirical work on the costs of different options on the basis of that we've been able to reduce a consensus that has effectively overridden the vested interest of the banking system because it wasn't based on prejudice it was based on an objective assessment of costs and also in relation to banking one of the um, debates I inherited was a rather futile argument between um, different groups of business people and the banks where one group was saying um, the banks were saying there's no demand, that's why we're not lending. And the other group was saying, you know, the banks are refusing to lend to us, the credit crunch. And it was a you know, these ludicrous tennis ball discussion, it's all your fault, it's all your fault. And as a result, we commissioned an independent piece of work, which the banks paid for, uh, which went in considerable detail into loan analysis, uh, found quite a lot of evidence of um, discouraged demand, which the banks had not previously acknowledged. Not an overwhelming problem, but a significant problem. And on the basis of that, we've been able to get them to modify their lending behavior to some extent. Now, none of these are perfect outcomes, uh, but they're all evidence, I think, of the way in which government can improve the way it operates by creating structures uh, which provide evidence and independent assessment. And where I think this potentially works so much better is where you have highly emotional issues. I mean, immigration is a classic one. Jonathan has written very well on this subject. Um, we have now got this uh, Migration Advisory Committee in 2007, hopefully will improve the quality of decision making in this area. But just, just to give an example about how good data collection can actually improve the quality of the debate, there is a, a group that's just published a piece of work called the Migration Observatory. And they try to get behind this debate about what the public feel. We have this sort of general assumption that the public are sort of anti-immigration and you know, have neuralgic views about it. But they sort of tried to disaggregate that big picture. And what they found was that, indeed, you know, the public had extremely passionate views about illegal immigration and asylum because they had no hostility to overseas students, which happens to be the main largest group of people coming into the country and who have been subject to control. You know, and on the basis of that, hopefully, we can progress to uh, sensible policy decisions. So those, those are all sort of positives. I thought, in conclusion, I should summarize what I think are some of the problems we have in trying to build up <coughs> evidence-based approach to decision-making. The first is that you may inadvertently um, choose the wrong measure. I wouldn't say necessarily the wrong way, but I think the, the most controversial case is probably the MPC, right? We had a measure of inflation, 
which is in goods and services, at no point in the last decade was there any need to incorporate asset prices. But as a consequence of that, partly as a consequence of that, we got this enormous bubble generated in the UK, um, you know, housing market, commercial property market, personal debtedness rose very substantially, and stability in the banking system, which can't all be put down to this, but had there been a parallel measure of asset prices along said goods and services, we may have had a different outcome in terms of interest rate setting. That just happened to be the way that the thing was assembled. But by, by measuring an inadequate, having an inadequate metric or the wrong metric, you may get bad outcomes. I think, uh, secondly, there are big areas of government where we simply don't have policies that enable evidence-based policy to be made in a sensible way. Um, uh, I think for the economists in, in this room probably feel incredibly frustrated that we don't have a system of road user pricing. And we don't have a system of aircraft pri user pricing because we don't, we don't allocate landing rights by auction. We don't tax uh, landing. Uh, so as a result, because there's no pricing mechanism, the demand's highly distorted and we, we don't have a sensible way of making objective decisions. Um, a third uh, problem area is that very often the process of accumulating evidence is very complicated, very time consuming and very resource consuming. One of the things we're trying to do in government at the moment is get on top of excessive regulation and what you regard as excessive regulation. To do that, you need proper regulatory impact assessments. That's actually quite complex, quite difficult. And you know, it requires a massive army of people to do them, and it's time consuming, and you have to reconcile things quickly. So there are, there are real practical constraints in advancing policies in areas of that kind. And the final, final point I would make, which is that, that, that there are really, really big decisions which um, evidence policy can't really help with. And I would argue, I think Jonathan may disagree with this, but I would argue probably the biggest decision the government has to make, which is about macroeconomic policy, is that tight because what we're having to do is balance the risk on one hand that if we cut the deficit too fast we uh, have negative impacts on growth. Now this that is something you can measure, you can model that with this past experience, but the risk on the other side is that we misjudge the risk appetite of markets and have a crisis of confidence because we're not cutting fast enough. So it's balancing those two risks. Now the second of those is in the jargon of non-linearity. It's not something we can capture. It's a cliff edge problem. Um, you know, how close to the cliff edge can you walk? And that's something you can't test empirically, if you <laughs> I mean, think about it. <laughs> so, so, so some of the really big issues we have to grope within government aren't even economic policy, and not issues on which economic analysis can give us a kind of definitive answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vince. A lot of very interesting examples there. Do you, in government, do you count much? You've, you've talked a lot about evidence-based uh, policy. Have you counted much policy-based evidence-making, which is uh, a mm -hmm. phrase that pops up in Vicky's, uh, in Vicky's paper? I mean, is it, do you see essentially the use of economists ever as trying to prove the policy works rather than trying to assess whether the policy works? Well, there is a certain amount of retrofitting, I think is what you're trying to say. Yeah. And, uh, One of the things I left. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the uh, abolition of EMA, of edu the educational maintenance allowance, is classic policy-based evidence making, where a report, you know, a very comprehensive and well-conducted set of evaluations, including by the IFS, concluded that this had was generally a sensible policy with a good value for money, and then uh, selected statistics were cherry-picked and taken out of context by Michael Gove and used to justify its abolition, which I think even the government is now quite embarrassed by in, in retrospect. But that's a, a classic. It, it does happen, clearly. It does it's happen. It happened under the last government, too. Let's not... No, of course. Yeah. Well, what that particular thing is trying to measure, I don't want to comment on whether it's right or wrong, but I mean, it, it is quite tricky, both in relation to EMA and a, a debate that's going on in governments about apprenticeships and training, which is how much is dead weight and how much is, is change at the market. Yeah. That's always a problem. But that's, that's where the IFS was taken yeah. to the yeah. test, wasn't it? And, it's, and, then, and then that was the very, yeah. Well, look, we've had a very interesting three set of presentations. And, we, uh, and I don't see much of a, a schism between the, uh, the different speakers. Just running through some of the roles we've heard about. I think one would be the role of economists as framers of issues. This is the 
Kit of Parts view of economics, in which really it's a kind of clear thinking that they bring to an issue using the kinds of tools of analysis like uh, opportunity cost or paradox of thrift. There's the evidence compilers, uh, particularly I think in I Vicky's view of it, um, not necessarily trying to put precise figures or forecasting, but trying to sort of weigh up whether there is strong evidence for or strong evidence against. Readers of the evidence. In Vince, we've heard of, I suppose this, it's, it's, it, it embraces the other two, but slightly separate, which is as imposers of rationality on policy, of depoliticizers mm -hmm. of policy making, in which you have someone whose role is essentially to argue from a, a, a sort of an evidence base, but without, if you like, the baggage of the, uh, uh, of, of the minister. We have also one mentioned, uh, I think it was Vince who pr pr used the word in, in relation to Vicky, the provoker. If you want somebody who sits in the corner and looks at it in a different way, who is contrary and who just, if you like, stimulates the discussion within government by coming up with a different way of looking at things. And that, I think, is a, a useful set of things that economists can do that are not telling you uh, what the economy is going to grow by next year uh, and getting it wrong. Um, okay, we have a very eminent uh, group on the floor here. I'd love to hear some of your comments and questions, and we'd like you to introduce yourselves. Have we got roving mics running around? Yes, we have a mic. We'll start with the uh, gentleman there, and then we'll take Andrew here. Yeah. Yes, yeah, that was you, yes. Sorry, I got squiffy eyes. I'm always um, the eyes. Hi, I'm Adam Sharples, until recently uh, Department for Work and Pensions. Um, Evan, you began by uh, declaring your dismay at the state of the economics uh, profession. The panel have given, actually, I, I thought really convincing accounts of good work being done by economists within government. And I'm just wondering whether you're now cheered up or <laughs> uh, whether... That, 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 as a matter of fact, I am cheered up, and it is precisely because the view of economics in government that we've had is not about producing a model that churns out the number and tells you the answer. And it's that, really, that I think is where economists... In, in which case, my follow-up right. question is, um, what, why the gap between your perception, which I have to say is one which I rather share, <laughs> uh, about the state of the profession as a whole and its contribution on some of the recent big issues. And maybe what's happening is that while so much good work is being done in supporting government decision making, somehow the capacity of the profession as a whole to address the big issues around, say, the structural deficit, finance, and yep, yeah. ability, uh, where growth is going to come from in the country over the coming years, somehow that is a lot weaker than it should be. I'd be interested in yeah. that. Yes, it's my, it's my answer to that. But I mean, maybe, uh, Vicky, you would like to start us off. Well, it's interesting about uh, the issues you raise because they're all sort of macro, in a way. As I was saying, you know, there's much more agreement on the micro, even though there's still some issues there. I mean, we, we, perhaps we may have more evidence uh, with little experiments, if you like, that we can do on the micro side. Uh, but the macro is issue, and um, a couple of years ago, there was a, a whole ESRC um, uh, review, which actually John Vickers. Uh, chairs, and I was on that uh, group, looking at the state of academic uh, research, because we actually work as a government economists, we work very closely with the academics. Um, so they're in and out, actually, of the various departments all the time, and we sponsor centres of looking at various things, what have you. Um, and we looked at basically how, what the state of UK academic economics was, and there were two, uh, micro came out very, very strongly. The areas which were looking really, you know, quite weak were behavioural economics, um, and macro, which had basically been ignored uh, for quite some time. And I'm not uh, blaming Gus for this, who said this is what macro sorted out, which he did famously say once, I think. Um, but actually, I think that there was perhaps less, much less attention put into understanding, because, of course, we were all growing as, you know, economists, and we thought that it was all sorted out. All you need to do is just, uh, you know, have, uh, you know, your monetary policy set in a certain way and what have you, and you'd be fine. But of course, as Vince is saying, we're forgetting asset price bubbles and everything else. I'm surprised you think the micro was all sorted out. I mean, the, the fact that you've said that this indicates okay. that we're about to have a terrible crisis in microeconomics. But it's not all sorted out, is it? I mean, no. we had lots of it has gone very, very wrong, the financial stuff, clearly. But more than that, the, the great debates over ownership versus liberalisation in the 80s. Actually, the, what economists argued was ownership didn't matter, liberalisation did. In fact, ownership did matter, and liberalisation has frequently been more complicated and more difficult and more 
flawed than economists thought back then. I've not this is true, but this is true. But at least you've got some of the evidence that tells you that perhaps you, you've ever done it that way, you should be doing things slightly differently, and the evidence and monitoring and evaluation tells you a certain thing. Better than the macro. Which is better than the macro, because you can actually react to that in a sense and say, and go to the and say, the evidence tells us this, and maybe we should really be looking at it. Even though there may be political ideologies that prevent yeah. you from doing this, at least you've got some of the evidence that says that, because of the way that behavior has developed over that period in those areas. And you can tell, of course, you can change that behavior, but change some of the environment around it, which is really quite quite interesting. And you can, up to point, experiment on it, mm. which is really interesting. It's, it's, it's very dangerous experimenting on the macro side and getting it hopelessly. Well, we've heard, we heard from Vince on the, on the difficulty of experimenting with the current um, fiscal austerity plan, but I'm, I'm interested in your view, Jonathan, on whether on the big picture, economics has anything to say. We can see how, or lots of little ways, it can make a contribution to clear things. Well, uh, and go going back to Adam's point, I think you know it's quite interesting actually to draw the contrast on the micro side between labour and financial regulation. In labour, I think actually the interplay between economists within government, the academic community on the other hand, and then actually the evaluation and evidence specialists uh, commissioned by the, the government has been very positive. Uh, the you know people, policy makers and economists within government took what was useful from the academic literature, not all of it, but much of it, and interacted very well with the evaluation community. Um, by contrast, on financial regulation, it all went horribly wrong. We, and I don't know whether that's because it was, l the what was coming out of the academics was less empirical or just too complicated to understand unless you had a PhD in mathematical physics, um, or we were just too intimidated by these very highly paid people working out in the private sector. But in any case, there was a, a sort of, to, uh, as opposed to what I think was a general, generally beneficial and complementary interaction between practitioners and academics on the labor side, on the financial regulation side, it was really it was quite toxic and, 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 and damaging. And I don't really know why that happened, but it's obviously certainly the case. Oh, go ahead. One of the problems is that people have tend to have short memories in, in government and actually many of the arguments about bank regulation were made in a government report that was published in the year 2000 under a man called Cruikshank and, yes, you know, the public yeah. and he demonstrated empirically that you know rates of return in the banking system were grossly excessive um, and could only be explained in terms of the fact that they were underpinned by the state and we're offering, operating a semi-monopolistic system in clearing, for example. And had that report been acted on, had the evidence been taken into account, the regulation of banks uh, would have been dealt with much earlier and probably on more Canadian lines and would have avoided a lot of the disaster we experienced. I'm, I'm going to ask John, John Gee to make a comment at this point, and then uh, we'll take another question back there. So, Sorry, I had a question, but um, well, oh, which sort of is a is a comment uh, because I'm fully persuaded that the same is true for Anita and for Michael. But I I did think that the panel, apart from you, I mean, it, it, it was rather kind on the panel. <laughs> Firstly, on the micro side, it seemed to align evidence-based policy with having economists doing it. Uh, as though, apart from economists, there's no one sensible <laughs> who can add up, apart from politicians who are, by definition, incapable of rational thought. <laughs> my, my, I do think that that is a major, major mistake. And slightly put, economics, where classics used to be, you know, <laughs> <laughs> my generation, where, or, you know, we always think, well, classics, what use is that? People would say, well, it's a way it teaches you to think properly. <laughs> and we seem to have got economics slightly incorrect. <laughs> so. And the second, <laughs> the second reason um, I, I uh, thought it was a bit kind was I mean, we've just had this huge economic crisis, and I'm one of the guilty men for that. Um, and uh, you have to ask, well, this is the worst sort of Western recession for 70 years. Who was at the wheel? And it, it's surely one of the really outstanding facts is that economic policy was being devised by professional economists to a greater degree than probably at any time in history as we went off the cliff. I mean, this is the British crisis 
material is that you don't do it in the way you have somewhere like the BC doing the Bank of Japan and, of course, the UK goes to the Fed. And Not to, to mention the Bank of England, just, just, just to continue. Yeah. By professional accountants. So I think your original point, you know, that maybe economics is too powerful in government has a, has a point. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm going to hold, hold that thought and we'll take some comments. Andrew here, and we'll take a couple of comments and then throw back to the floor. Yeah. Thank you, Evan. Andrew Kahn, I'm a governor here at the Institute, and, and uh, I'm afraid now a banker, so I hardly dare enter this, uh, this room, um, but also a formerly an admiring colleague of Vicky's in the Department of Business and, and uh, uh, Sir Vince. Um, just on the scrappage point which, which Vicky made, I mean, I do have a slightly different recollection. My recollection is that Vicky came up with some very clear economic and strong economic evidence, which I just couldn't get round. Uh, uh, that it wasn't economically justified, so I had to seek a direction. I got one, but the interesting coda to that is a few months ago I met Peter Mandelson, who gave the direction, and we were discussing this. And I hope it's not betraying a confidence when, I, you know, I said, "Well, I, I thought it was the right decision," and he said, "Well, you got it completely wrong, Andrew. Don't, won't you admit it now?" The Kravitz scheme was a great success, and of course, American and German policymakers would think the same. So I just ask the point. Vicky is convinced that we're wrong, but the politicians and the populations think it was a good decision. Yeah, and they don't like and, and they don't like Jonathan's uh, migration. But they don't. <laughs> but the, the question I wanted to ask was on structures in government, which Vic, uh, Vince was getting on to. I mean, we Germany has an economics ministry, which is as powerful as its finance ministry. In this country, despite Vince's best efforts, I don't think we can claim to have that. Would it be a good idea if economics was more deeply rooted in the structure of government by having a more powerful economics ministry? Question one. Question two, we don't have a, particularly a planning function uh, in, in Whitehall, which the French, for example, do, where economists dominate. Would it be better if we were, we were to have a national plan, which econo uh, economists created, Third question, the previous government did have the Nation National Economic Council so that decisions were taken specifically as, uh, by economists. Should we have that? Right, thank you very much. Can I park the question about the structure? Because I want us to come back to that, but I just want us to finish, if you like, on the very basic discussion about the use of economists. Um, Sir John's point, some of the comments about the... Following on from, from Sir John's question, I just want to get some comments from the floor, and then we will have five minutes on the structure, because actually, in Vicky didn't talk about it, but in her paper, she talks a bit about embedded economists versus centralized economists. Okay, um, <coughs> Graham, and then the gentleman back here. Yeah, uh, if you could just introduce yourself, Graham. Uh, Graham Matt, the European Policy Forum. I'd actually follow the John Gieve line. I, th I think it's a pity Vince wasn't here to hear the FD invection against <laughs> failings of the profession, perhaps you can give it afterwards. But, um, <laughs> I'd make one exception, perhaps um, monetary economics did make an enormous difference, albeit it was transferred into the MPC, but they can see in the 80s an enormous change and probably a beneficial one. I think picking up the other points, it, it must be right that we must pay attention to other professions. Is accounting influential enough in government decision making? Probably it is now, probably accounting officers and the NAO and the select committees and the rest. Are lawyers influential enough in government decision making? Certainly not. I mean, look at the war in Iraq, uh, look at the difficulties of the ministerial code, look at our tendency to operate by discretion rather than rules. And that's a pity because if we look at chancellors, some of the most successful have been lawyers. I <laughs> think of Geoffrey Howe, I think of Kenneth Clark, and I think of Alistair Darling and per contra. <laughs> Um, yes, the gentleman here, and then one at the back. We'll just take a few comments, and then we'll come back to the floor, and then we'll discuss your point, Andrew, about the structure. Um, Mark McDonald, I'm a private equity investor for my sins. Um, just a quick question. Does the government have too many economists? And uh, just echoing the gentleman's prior comment, um, should they open the door more to um, private sector economists as well as um, academia as you do, uh, but in a sort of a less dominant way, uh, which is government dominated, and should you just be a facilitator of these new ideas coming in uh, to government to affect policy? Yeah, so that's, it's a good point. We'll just take the last point at the back, and then I'm going to get a, a question, and then I'm going to ask you about the structures. Yeah. Thanks, Matthew Hancock. Um, 
isn't it um, one of the things that I've taken out of the discussion is often economist and objective are seen to be the same thing. But <laughs> couldn't economists have the humility, given that we know that really, uh, if you're an economist, what you know is the limits of your knowledge. Um, shouldn't really we have the humility to accept that all economic advice is itself subjective and we should just be open to the subjectivity and, and, and honest about the subjectivity in any economic advice. Um, Jonathan and I could argue until the cows come home that, um, about the economics of immigration. You know, we, I, I understand the lump of labor fallacy, um, fallacy, but we'd still disagree quite strongly. But so whenever either of us put forward our economic advice on immigration, we should have the humility to accept that there are other arguments around. Right, we, we, we've had a lot of good points there. I want the panel just to comment really from Sir John's point to the, is it really as objective as we kind of portrayed it? And then I'm going to ask you each separately to come into this issue of how economists are organized because I think that's interesting. Um, Vince, let me start with you on the, on the, the set of points we've heard around the, the general okay, issue. Well, on, on Sir John Goose's point about the great financial crisis and didn't economists let us down? Well, of course, in many respects did. Uh, I mean, you know, the efficient markets theory proved to be a, you know, a bad theory. Uh, we had, um, you know, Sir Charles Goodhart's often made the point that he taught people like me banking at university and in recent years banking's been withdrawn from the curriculum on the grounds it wasn't an interesting problem anymore and terrible kind of mistakes of that kind but I think when the crisis actually struck I think we should all be grateful for the fact that Bernanke um, had actually read and understood the experience of the interwar period and in particular he studied Friedman and understood that in this kind of appalling apocalypse you know you pump money into the system and you keep interest rates down could very easily have gone the other way I mean we could have had Trichet or somebody running the Reserve Bank of America with catastrophic consequences um, but you, you had you know a good economist in the right place at the right time making good policy and maybe we will eventually be overwhelmed but I think that you know that's shown both the good and the bad of it in terms of structure um, the question was posed to me well shouldn't we have a more powerful biz which is the question and I suppose on one level um, you'd say well of course but the question what would you actually transfer because I mean Fiscal policy is of its nature in the finance ministry uh, and is likely to remain so, public spending control, tax, nobody suggests of changing that. Monetary policy has been outsourced to the Bank of England anyway, as is, you know, financial regulation is done somewhere else. So what would you transfer? Um, it's not clear. I mean, if somebody can tell me, I'd be great. I'd make a bid for it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then I think the sort of final question is, so again, Sir John raised, and I, I sort of answer in a slightly unexpected way, I think, which is wh what, what do economists contribute that sort of common sense people can't, uh, you know, after all their other professions where people add up? I, I think I'll answer that in relation to my private sector experience because I was in a big international oil company and I was surrounded by accountants and engineers, you know, all of whom are very able and very sensible. And, and I sort of asked at the time and since, well, what did I contribute because I was an economist? I think there were two things. One, one of them was the idea of importance of change at the margin. Uh, and one of the big arguments I had and won in Shell was with a lot of engineers who thought it was absolutely imperative that we remove 100% of all sulfur from oil refineries because it, it was, you know, environmentalists were asking for it, so it must be a good thing. And as professional engineers, they had to get rid of the last gram of... <laughs> well, you could draw them a cost curve <laughs> beyond 98%. It was suicidely inefficient. Uh, but So I was arguing for more pollution on, the, on good economists <laughs> with marginal costs and, and, and in relation to marginal revenue, and I won that argument. Uh, the second is a rather simple point, but uh, e economists, I think, do instinctively uh, are suspicious about extrapolation, right? And what, one of the things that, of course, happens in the oil industry, like other industries, is that you just automatically extrapolate past trends, uh, you know, oil demand or oil prices. Uh, but economists are there to point out there are things called demand elasticities and supply elasticities, and things change. 
Uh, one of the things that worries me a little bit at the moment about policy in the energy sector is this sort of belief that oil and gas prices will rise forever. Well, maybe, but you know, we know there are vast s supply out there which could eventually tip the balance in the other direction. Demand may be influenced by price. Um, and as an economist, you can influence that debate because of the training you've had. Thank you very much. Uh, Vicky, why don't you take us through? Yeah, I'll, I'll take uh, just a few of the points. Um, the, of course, we value the other professions. We just happen to um, be slightly stronger in terms of the influence we have in government. But the others are sort of catching up. Um, and there is quite a section in my little pamphlet on this. So, but the economists add value by working with those professions. Uh, the other professions are not substitutes for us. I mean, that's the basic, that's, that's the way <coughs> we look at it. And we're not complacent. Um, and there's a lot of sort of cross fertilization going on between the various, and this has been getting much, much closer, in fact, uh, also in terms of how they run in government. Um, so the social researchers and the economists are now sort of lumped together in terms of how it's managed across, across Whitehall, uh, which is very good news. Uh, so just to reassure you that, um, yes, we are a s slightly big headed, but not that big headed um, in, in government. So um, the, the issue about getting input from externals. Um, and of course, it's absolutely a, val it's a very, very valid point. Um, but it does happen quite a lot. Not only uh, do we work with academics, but also lots of private sector economists come into government to work for, for that. I came from the private sector myself. I worked for the, a bank and then uh, a rival oil company. Uh, and then I was a partner in KPMG. Uh, there are other people, some in the 90s, who've done the same. Um, so Chris Nicholson over there, who has been in and out of government. Uh, various stages, and uh, uh, the current, the new, after a lot of effort, since we were unable to appoint anyone for a while, great frustration, in the energy department, the new chief economist, um, it came from Shell. So he's the chief economist of Shell has now become the chief economist of Jet. So hopefully there'll be a bit more uh, sort of um, common sense in that department too as a result uh, of this. But it does happen all the time. And if you look at um, what's been going on in biz, you find loads of in pockets where actually it's loads of private sector people there working. Um, and we get a lot of influence from, from them, plus of course we work with other think tanks and what have you. So rest assured that that actually happens. I have a real worry about whether that can continue to be the case, particularly given the economic environment that, that we're seeing. I mean, it, it, in some ways, if people lose their jobs, they might find it you know, a lot easier to come and work for us for the lower salaries. Uh, oh, sorry, for the public sector, in some ways, uh, for their salaries. It may happen, but what you might not find is the hospitalization of people going out and having that experience um, there. And uh, I, I should get those other questions. Well, okay, let, because it's been started off with us, us off on it, is it's the issue of structure. Do you want a sort of central core of economics in a department of economics, or in each department? Do you want a central core of the sort of the economists who sit in a little room on their own, or do you want them out there? I mean, I oh my God, they, they, they should never sit in a room of their own. I mean, that's, that's, that, then that's fatal. <laughs> I don't think that anyone, ever suggested that. But they used to sit in the rooms on their own. And I think that's changed very dramatically over the last, certainly the last decade, probably the last two decades. Um, what about a department for economics, which is a kind of a, a big room for them sitting on their own? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that that's the idea. I don't think that when we talk about a department for economics, we actually mean a department full of okay. economists. We mean a department that is actually looking at the economy more widely, with the Treasury being a finance department, and this one being an economics department. I think that was your, your question, Andrew. So rather than putting right. all the economists in the center, that would be absolutely, right. you know, right. uh, the economists need to be right next to the policy makers. So, and if they don't influence the policy, they shouldn't be there. They might as well just go and, and be it academic. It would certainly seem to be that if we, if we go with the sort of list of uses of economists that came out of the three of you, that they're people who provoke, uh, look at things in different ways, and they weigh up evidence, they ration, bring a degree of sort of objective rationality to conversations uh, uh, away from political ideology, and they frame issues usefully using the toolkit. You would, you would want them as close to the policy making as, as possible. Well, not what, what used to happen before, and I have a little bit of that in the pamphlet, is that, in fact, it still happens at times, hence the sort of re retrofitting of evidence, is that there's industry capture. Uh, if you're sponsoring a particular sector, they're going to be always there trying to, to talk to you about you know, what they need in their, in their uh, sector from you, usually money, uh, or you know, whatever other concessions there might be. Um, and it's interesting because the policy makers who are there, I mean, they're there to make policy and they seem to think that it's fantastic if they make a policy that helps those sponsoring departments, not actually necessarily thinking the opportunity cost, 
um, we hear really yep. they've got whatever it is, and we're here to look for this sort of, of hole. And, and the problem is that city, uh, that, that uh, departments exist to make policy, and that's what they think. Um, and, and if they come with a, you know, let's, you know, we're here to do a bill. I mean, our job is to, to build the parliament, to put them together, and the greatest job is being in the build team. And of course, you need policies. I mean, there's no right. other bill without policy. And, um, and therefore, you know, we're failing if we just sit here, just making sure that things are just <laughs> all right, or implementing some interesting stuff. So you're under constant pressure. So yeah. you need the economists to be influential. You, think you need them to be senior. You need them to be there. You need uh, to understand what the, the pressures are, <coughs> rather than having the policy go to one place and the economy somewhere else and no access right. to the ministry. OK. Um, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Just Bonnie Tones, Parliamentary Radio. I've commented a lot on the BBC and Eastern Region Home Affairs, Social Affairs, and um, I think one of the most challenging things that Vicky said was regarding the role of a civil service and wanting a different model of it, because while we talk about House of Lords reform, actually nobody else is focusing on whether the civil service delivers. Yeah. And, you know, from the Crossland memo onwards, when he wanted to introduce comprehensive education and found out he had no power to do anything in any school in Britain, you know, the reform of the civil service agenda seems to have been forgotten. So, you know, what do you mean you want the civil service to change with the government? I don't actually want to. No, you, 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 like, you like the British. Quite the opposite. Yeah, I yeah, actually yeah. want them to, to, to be permanent, um, impartial, uh, and still influential. So, whereas what happens in other countries is that they lose their, the people at the top, anyway, in civil service, lose their positions every time there's a government change. Explicitly not wanting the reform Absolutely. that takes you towards some other. I just want to get a last, we, 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 we have to wrap up in a, in a couple of minutes, but let's get some last comments from Jonathan on the, the general mood and uh, about the general role of the economist. Um, over. Back to John's very fair challenge. Uh, very briefly, I think my, my perception is that you know, we, the main cause of this crisis that, that's down to economists was on the financial side rather than the, the macro side. Obviously, there were mistakes in macro, but the fundamental mistakes were taking, as Vince says, uh, the, some of the more extreme versions of the efficient market hypothesis and its corollaries in terms of what that meant for risk allocation far too literally and m not challenging that. And that, for me, was a failure of government economists and, and others within government. Um, but during the crisis, I think, as, as been said, macro and macro policy makers performed quite well. And to the extent that they haven't in the last year or two, back to my point about Krugman, it's not taking serious people seriously, uh, not just Krugman, but Keynes and Hicks. And if we'd actually listened and thought about what they said and taken them seriously, uh, we, uh, we'd have had better policy. So I don't think, you know, Evan, quite rightly poked some fun at the SGE mo models uh, before we started. But actually, nobody in government really ever took those models very seriously anyway. So while that's maybe a criticism of economics, I'm not sure it's a criticism of e economics yeah. in government. No. Um, briefly on, on Matt's point, um, I agree entirely. I mean, I think I said in what I said that, you know, uh, your job is to assess without prejudice when evidence is good enough this requires judgment, but it's clearly not ideology-free and is subjective. Um, and I make no bones in saying that some of my views about immigration and how I present them probably are subjective. On the other hand, um, there is, I don't believe there's any doubt that anyone assessing the evidence objectively without prejudice would conclude that there's little or no empirical evidence to suggest that immigration has any significant negative effect on the wages or employment of British workers. That's just what the evidence says, and, and most serious economists agree about that. Um, so, you know, there, as I, there is subjectivity and ideology, and it's, you know, one should not pretend that economists are in some way objective and non-political. They are not. Um, we are social scientists. We are not physicists. Uh, so the, the basic point, I agree. But I do think there is a something nonetheless that one can contribute in the way of giving judge, you know, objective advice without prejudice and while recognizing that it is influenced by one's own uh, subjective and ideological um, frame. Ladies and gentlemen, we do have to wrap up. I wanted to take some um, shows of hands. <coughs> How many of you here regard yourself as an economist, you know, to a sort of post-grad level or something like that? How many e economists do we have here? Okay, H of the people who are economists, how many of you agree with 
Jonathan's non-controversial assertion just then that everyone would agree with that immigration has no discernible effects on the, what was the phrase? On, on the no significant negative effect on the employment or the employment of work. Person. How many of you agree with that proposition of the economists, of the economists? How many of you don't agree with that? <laughs> so there was a degree of... <laughs> okay, there was, <laughs> there was a degree of consensus on that. Very interesting. Right, how many of you here think uh, economists should... I'm going to just have a simple vote. How many of you think they should have more influence in government? And um, how many less? And I'll, uh, we'll just sort of take the difference. A lot of you may think they're about right. How many of you think economists should have more influence in government? In, in the UK, in the UK, in UK policy making. How many of you think less? Oh, it's actually just about... Uh, have a story. The, the, the economists just about slightly have it. It was a slight. Well, slightly. slightly. Oh, excuse me. This is a very, very subjective sort of how yeah. how <laughs> look at it. How many, how many do you think that it's about right at the moment? I would say that was the, that was the biggest number. We, we, we agree on that. We agree on that. All right. Well, look, we've had a lot of very provocative thoughts. I think it was surprising. It was not, not surprising, but it was interesting that the roles of economists were delineated in very similar ways across the three uh, presentations, even though they use very different examples. And language. And I think it is instructive that while they um, uh, had the characteristic swagger of economists, there was nevertheless a uh, there was nevertheless a degree of humility actually in the role that was being specified. And if you if you actually listen to what was said, I think actually it was quite a, a modest but important role rather than the kind of economist rule the world role, which I think is a a good thing given where economist is. But it is fascinating, as, as Vicky pointed out, the paradox that economists, economics in its worst crisis, I think, really for quite a while, over its failures, never, the, never seems to have been more important, more talked about, and economists more valuable, which is a very sort of fascinating, fascinating place for economists and government to be. Can we just thank our speakers and then have drinks <laughs> downstairs? Thank you very much. Everybody.